Okay, so how is everyone today? Good. So, okay, so last time we left on an exciting note. The exciting note was, as I said, something that uh, was the first kind of time you heard that kind of thing. It was a little bit controversial. So let's, let's, let's write it down again so that we can take a good look at it and convince ourselves. So today's the fifth. Okay, so specifically, we were talking about uh, how does the derivative interact with uh, the, the various things you can do with functions. So given two functions you can, that, are, that are compatible, you can add them together and get a new function. Well, how does the derivative interact with adding functions? It's additive, right? It's additive. So the, you can take two functions, add them together first, and then compute derivative. Or you can take the two functions, compute their derivatives separately, and add the results together. And, it's, and, and the end result is the same. So the derivative is additive. Furthermore, if you have a function and a scalar, you can multiply that function by a scalar, which is to say, every time you give, the, it, you can multiply the function by a new scalar to get a new function. And what I mean by that is the new function is uh, defined by you plug in whatever you value you want into the original function, take the output, and then multiply it by that scalar. So, as for the derivative, you can either multiply the function by the scalar first and then compute derivative, or you can compute derivative first and then multiply this by the scalar, and uh, the, the end result should be the same. So that says what about the derivative? It's homogeneous, and taking those together, the derivative is linear. Okay, great. Furthermore, uh, if you have two functions, two functions like the following, so now we're getting to fine details so I can't just say them out loud. If we have u as a subset of Rn open, uh, a is in u, and we have, this was item number what? <laughs> Continuing from last time, was it five? So we were on five. So I'm 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 redoing that one because it, I, my teacher since t told tells me that it was a bit controversial. <clears throat> so suppose that we have f. Was it f that was the scalar valued one? <clears throat> yeah. So f is scalar valued and g is vector valued, <clears throat> so f is from, from uh, this open set to the reals, g is from this open set to rm, <clears throat> uh, and both are differentiable at, uh, at input a then we can compute the product function. So in the first place, the product f of x, uh, well, the product function f g evaluated at x defined by f of x g of x, in the first place, this product makes sense. Why does this product make sense? Because it's a scalar times a vector, right? So we've got to be careful when we have two vectors, uh, because when, when you write them side by side, because what could that possibly mean? Right? So if you write, when you write two things side by side, that usually means product. Okay, but in the case of vectors, if you write vectors side by side, the meaning is, am is ambiguous. Because you might mean dot product, and conceivably, what else might you mean? Cross product. Okay. So, uh, this, this is scalar times vector, so this makes sense. 
because it's scalar times vector. And furthermore, the derivative of the product function evaluated at A applied to H follows the product rule. So uh, that is to say the derivative of the first one times the second plus the first one times the derivative of the second, except there's a bit of a, of a surprise, I guess. So it'll be the derivative of the first one, the derivative of f evaluated at a applied to h, and then times g of x, uh, sorry, g of a, and then plus the first one evaluated at a multiplied by the derivative of g evaluated at a and then applied to h. Okay, so now let's try and determine whether or not this makes sense. Okay, so can, can, this, can this possibly make sense? Okay, so as a matrix, that's what I mean by writing these square brackets around uh, the derivative of f evaluated at a, what is the rows and columns of df at a? It's one by n, one row, in columns. So that is to say that this is a row vector. So this is 1 by n. It's 1 by n. It's got to be 1 by n because remember, what's the signature of f? It's, it's n to 1. It's rn to r1. So as a result, the, the, the rows and columns of its derivative needs to be 1 by n. This kind of input, that kind of output. Okay, then what kind of thing is h? It's n by 1. So this is n by 1. And then what kind of thing is g? Sorry? Uh, g is m by m, Mike by 1. So of course by this, there's implied parentheses here. These, apply, uh, these implied parentheses here. So now, these big green parentheses here. Please tell me when, <laughs> because this is, a matri this is a product of matrices, what is the size, what are the rows and columns of the thing inside of green parentheses? One by one. It's a scalar. It's a scalar. Of course, it has to be. It has to be a scalar because what this is, is this is the linearization of F. And f outputs a scalar, so, so must its linearization, right? OK, good. Uh, so taking all that together, what, is, what kind of thing is this? This is m by 1. That is to say, this thing that we're looking at is an rm. Is, is that good? Of course it is, right? Because, because the product function has to output things in Rm. OK. Well, what's the size of this? That, that one right there. <laughs> one by one, right? <laughs> it's kind of a clumsy way to say scalar. Okay, so this is one by one. And then what's the size of this one? M by n. Right, because g is the kind of thing that takes a vector of n components and outputs a vector of m components. Okay, then what is this? What is the size of h? H. N by one, right? So, so there's implied parentheses here also. So inside of the green parentheses, inside of the green parentheses, what is that thing? M by it's m by one. Yeah, Mike by one. So then, what is this whole thing? M by one. So this is our 
That's also an RM. So do you observe that this is a compatible sum? Okay. All of these products are compatible and the sum is also compatible. Now, a lot of students kind of object to saying, uh, wanting to, uh, so, sort of being forced to having H in the formula. In the sense that uh, up to now in scalar calculus, you didn't have to write the increment in any, in any of the formulas. Right? You could say, well, the derivative of uv is u prime v plus uv prime. Right? No h's. Isn't that nice? Well, can we do this one without h's? You just can't. You just can't. So let's, let's, let's write what it would be like if it had no h's, and let's observe that it, it could only be nonsense. So suppose we do that. And all I'm doing is I'm just writing the exact same formula but without H's in it. <clears throat> so now it kind of looks like the product rule that you are familiar with, but now let's consider. What's the size of this? 1 by n. And what's the size of this one? m by 1. This is not compatible. It's just not a compatible multiplication. Okay? E e even if it were, some of you might be thinking, well, what if m is n? Well, then what would the size of this be? This would, so so even, even if m were n, even if those were the same, then this would be 1 by 1. So keep that in mind. What's the, what's the size of this one? 1 by 1. And what's the size of this one? m by n. So even if m and n were the same, this one would be a scalar, and that one would be a matrix. <laughs> Can't do it. Okay, so does, everybody, does everyone see that trying to just, in a sense, textually delete the H from the formula results in what can only be considered nonsense. Okay. <clears throat> so now, this makes calculus uh, spirits cry, right? So you can't do this. So, so as a remark within this remark, I want to, yes? Uh, I understand why we need the H, but where do we pull the H from? What is H equal to? The number of units of one. Okay, so that, that's exactly what I'm going to talk about right now. Okay. So to make, a, to make a remark within a remark, uh, I, need, I need to explain to you the H. So what really I'm going to tell you, in, in the end, the upshot of the, the remark is this, is that I know that it seems like the H was never there in your scalar calculus um, experience. But really, it, it was always there. It was always there, and, just, and now, now we're, it's just now being brought to your attention that you just can't be without it anymore. It was okay for it to only be implied before, but now it's not. Okay, specifically, specifically, uh, so this is remark within a remark. So I'm, I guess I'm going to pause this one. and make a new remark. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define, define delta f, delta f to be the following function. It is, uh, it is a function that takes two arguments, a and h. A and H, and what it does is it maps this to F of A plus H minus F of A. Okay, and then the common name for this is the, the increment of F at A with increment H. So what this is saying is that, okay, I want you to take the function F, Take the function f, and at location a, 
And in my head, I always use A because that, I take that to mean anchor. So at, at position A, let's increment, in, let's increment by the amount H. And so this is what it would look like. Okay, then the idea is that, well, if F is differentiable at A, if F is differentiable at A, and if H is small, then this increment of F at A with increment H is well approximated by the derivative. And here's the derivative. So the derivative of F, and again, this is the, I, I talked about the Greek Latin joke, right? Yes. Okay. So, right, when you compute a limit, of Greek, the Greek symbols become the Latin symbols. So, ha, ha, right? What the derivative does is it also takes two arguments. It also takes two arguments, a location, an anchor, and also an increment. And what it does is it maps them to the matrix of the derivative at A multiplied by H. <clears throat> so the fundamental idea of differentiability is the following, is that to be differentiable, at A means that the absolute value, not, not absolute value, but the norm of the increment of F minus the derivative of F at AH is small. <coughs> when H is small. So this is what differentiability means. So what I want to draw out from you, draw out from the topic and impress upon you, is that differentiability really requires two arguments. It really requires two arguments. It requires the location where you're going to compute the derivative and also how you're going to step away from that new origin when you're at that point. So it helps to have a picture. And of course, I can only I can only draw in so many dimensions. So suppose we have our favorite input, our anchor point, A. So here's A. Okay, so here's the point, here's the, here's the curved object, the curvy object, and what we want to do is observe, well, this, this curved object is differentiable at input A. Because it's differentiable at input A, it is, it is very well approximated by a flat surface, a, a flat thing. The flat thing is the tangent. So that's the tangent. And what I want you to, one of the things I want to remind you of is that this, this space right here, the blue space, the tangent space, is it a linear space? It's not linear in the sense that it's not going through the origin for the original coordinate system. But when you move the origin to this new location, it is linear. It's linear. So now from this location, from input A, suppose that we decide to step an, an increment, H, so that we say, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to step over an incremental amount, H. 
Okay, that is to say, from this origin, let's move over that much. H. Then could someone please tell us what is delta F and what is D F? Yeah, it, it's saying that to, to, to know what delta F is, is to say that from this origin, the new origin, to obtain delta F, what delta F is, it's like following the curve, following the red surface. Following the red surface. Whereas DF is what? Following the blue line. So instead of following the curved bit, follow the flat bit. So specifically, specifically, This bit is delta F, uh, delta F evaluated at anchor A with increment H. So that's what this is. That's how much F changes, the output of F changes when you increment by H. What's DF? It's this bit. So this is df evaluated at a applied to h. It's a little crowded in there. Good. So what I want to impress upon you is that you can't really make sense of the derivative without the two inputs. Where it is occurring, that tells you where the new origin is, and how you're going to step away from the new origin. OK. <clears throat> So, now let's go back to that previous remark, resume. So now we're in point six. So suppose that we have F from U to RM, and we also have G from U to RM. So now, for, formerly, F was scalar valued and G vector valued. Now, uh, F and G are both vector valued, and, and they're the same kind of vector, right? They're both, they're both M. So let's define. Let's define F dot g evaluated at x in the only way you possibly could. So how are we going to define this? So by dot, I mean dot product. So this would be, uh, this would be f of x and then dot product g of x. So what's the signature of f dot g then? It'll be Rn to R, right? So you're going to input vectors with n coordinates, and then a scalar is going to come out. OK? So, no, so observe that this is Rn to R. OK, so now the question is, is how will we, how is the derivative of this, of this dot product function defined okay, in terms of the derivatives of the original functions? OK, so again, we have this issue where we have to say where we're evaluating at A, this defines for us the new origin. And then we have to say how we're stepping, how we're incrementing away from the origin. So we're going to need two things to define what the derivative does. We're going to need the, the location where it's occurring at A and the increment from this location, H. So then uh, the derivative of fg at a applied to h is going to have to be, well, what? So it really is you just have to follow your nose. So this is, this is not product. 
exactly, right? It's not exactly product in the sense of scalar times vector, but it is still a product. So the answer is, is going to look like product rule. So how will we do it? Uh-huh. Derivative of f at a, and then what? H. Applied to h, and then what? Dot product. Dot product. G. G. So I'll draw big dots. Uh, yeah, it should be at a. Thank you. OK, then what? Plus. F evaluated at A, then what? Dot. Dot. The derivative of G at A, and then what? Applied to H. So now let's see, does, does this make sense in the sense, of, uh, in the sense of are all the products and sums compatible products and sums? OK, what is the size in, in terms of rows and columns of the derivative of F evaluated at A? This is m by n. M, m by n, because f has signature rn to rm. Then what is the size of h? n by 1. And of course, there's an implied, there's an implied uh, parentheses around here, like so. Okay, so then inside of those green parentheses, what is the size of that object? So, so, so yes, I agree in the first place it's m, m, Mike, by 1. But do you also agree that this is a compatible product? Yeah. So this is m by 1. Okay, then what is the size of g? M, m by 1 because G outputs one of these. And then, is this product defined? Yes. It is defined because remember that this is dot product. So we need, we need two of the same kind of vectors. So an M by one and also an M by one. Then, supposing that we carry out the dot product and actually do it, this whole term right here, what's its size? Yeah. It, it's a scalar, it's one by one. So, did we want it to be a scalar? Yes, right? <laughs> because this function, the dot product function, inputs, it has signature Rn to scalars. So its output needs to be a scalar. Therefore, surely its the output of its linearization also needs to be a scalar. Good. Similar things go for this one, right? Good. So any questions about this one? Notably. Notably, if you were to just try to textually delete that H, if you were to try to textually just delete that H, then, then you would be asking, would you please compute the dot product of this matrix, M by N matrix, and that M by 1 vector? And of course, this is nonsense. It's madness. Okay. Any question about this? Okay, so let's have an example of actually computing. Then we can move on to something interesting. <clears throat> okay, so for example, uh, suppose the following. So suppose, suppose that, uh, suppose that F is from I don't, I, need, I don't even need to write this. I'll just do it like this. So suppose that f at uh, 24, 51. So it has two, <laughs> two inputs. Uh, and at 24, 51, its, uh, its value is, say, mm, 1, 2, 3. And also suppose that G at that same input, 24, 51, its output is, uh, I don't know, uh, 314. 
So f, so at those at those specific uh, at the specific input of 24 in the first coordinate and 51 in the second one, they do this. So what are the signatures of f and g? R2 to R3. R2 to R3. Okay. Then I could ask, well, what's the dot product of f and g at the input? So I could ask, please tell me, what is f dot product g at 24, 51? So what would it be? Well, I, let, let me make sure I can do it. So it would be 3 plus 2, that's 5. And then plus 12, yeah, 17. It would be 17. OK, good. So any question about that? OK, suppose further. Suppose further that the derivative of f evaluated at uh, 24, 51. Well, so in the, in the first place, what kind of thing do I need to write over here? A matrix. I have to write a matrix. And then, how many rows and columns must it have? It's to have three rows and one column. So it's going to have to look like this. Okay, now before, no, three rows and two columns, thank you. Uh, so is there any question why it simply must look this way in order for this to make any sense? Okay, so now I'm just going to, since I'm just making an exercise up, I'm just going to just fill it up here. So how about, uh, let's give us a couple of zeros to make it not too bad on us, on ourselves. So five, uh, negative two, six, maybe another zero. Okay, then, <coughs> Uh, suppose further that the derivative of g evaluated at 24, uh, 24, 51. So, so what kind of thing do I have to write over here? It's the same kind of thing. Okay, so it has to look like, so how about 1, uh, 2, 3, 7, negative 2, 4? Suppose further that, that this is the case. Then I want you to calculate, I want you to calculate, uh, calculate the derivative of the dot product function evaluated at input 2451. Notably, if I were to stop writing right here, you would be unable to proceed. You wouldn't be able to do it. Okay, so I have to say, uh, applied to what? Some increment. Now my question to you is, what kind of thing do I have to write in there? A two by one matrix, right? Uh, two rows and one column. The reason is because, remember, we're linearizing, linearizing uh, the input here. So whatever kind of input we have here, uh, 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 a vector with two components, that's also what kind of thing the increment should be. So this is where you're doing it. So this is the location of the new origin. And this is how you're stepping away from the new origin. Okay, so then, uh, I don't know. Usually you make these with decimals when you're doing a real problem, but I don't want to deal with it, so let's do one and two. Okay, so then altogether, this is just now a big arithmetic question. Okay, so we can figure this out by saying that, well, it must be, it must be the derivative of f at 24, 51, applied to the increment 1, 2, and then dot product that with g evaluated at 24, 51, and then plus f evaluated at 24, 51, dot product, the derivative of g evaluated at 24, 51, applied to the increment 1, 2. So is there any question why it ends up looking just so? <clears throat> any question about this? Yes? So 
we just chose an age as long as the right dimensions, and you said it should be small, but do we need to ever make anything specific in that? Well, no, I would give you the, if, if, I do a, if I do a question like this, I'd say do it, do it for this A and for this H. Okay. I'm saying that if, if this were a real, if you were doing something for real, for real, that instead of you know, some contrived example like we're doing right here, uh, the increment is usually pretty small. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so, other questions about why it looks just so? Yes? Mm -hmm. Is there no way to like find what the limit of that? Like eventually, will it stop changing so much? We can kind of like why can't we just then assume that our increment is approximately zero? I'm not sure I understand your question. Is there a way to find the limit of when we make the increment extremely small? Well, the limit of it would be zero because then it, then you'd be asking. Suppose that I suppose that I'm standing right here. And suppose I don't move, then where am I standing? Right here. <laughs> that, that's the kind of, that, that's what you're asking. So there, there's, there's two things to, to uh, evaluating a derivative. It's in the first place, where are you going to evaluate it? That's, that's telling you where the new origin is. That's telling you where you're putting your origin. Then the question is, is from, from this new origin from this A, this anchor, how are you going to move away? And so if you, if you don't move at all, then you're still there. <clears throat> so you haven't moved at all. I don't know if I've answered but your I mean, question. If we, if we get really, really close, I don't mean not move at all, but then our, our slope gets more accurate to the true, to the true curve. <clears throat> okay. But so, if we want to find as accurate of a derivative as possible, so we want to find as small of an increment as possible. Right? Ah, so I, I, I take it to mean you're saying you want the difference between the increment of f applied at a h and the derivative of f applied at a h to be as small as possible? Well, yeah, it, they're only going to be close. They're only guaranteed to be close when h is small. I mean, I agree entirely with that. I think we may be saying the same thing. I'm not sure. <clears throat> Okay, let's continue. So, we want to carry this out. This is just a big arithmetic problem now. Uh, so, this would be 0, 1, 5, negative 2, 6, 0, and then multiplied by 1, 2, and then that is, of course, in parentheses, then dot product uh, g, which is 3, 1, 4, plus f, which is 1, 2, 3, dot product, the derivative of g is 1, 3, 2, <coughs> 2, 7, 4, multiplied by 1, 2. Uh, did I make a mistake somewhere? Yeah, negative 2, thanks. Uh, like this. Okay, so in the first place, are all of these, are all of these products and sums compatible? Yeah, they're all compatible because this is uh, 3 by 2 and this one 2 by 1. So, yeah, we can do that. The result will be 3 by 1 and then dot product with another 3 by 1. So that's going to work. Similar for the other one. So uh, doing that, uh, this would be uh, in, the first, in the first row, it would be 2. In the second row, it would be 5 minus 4 is 1. And in the third, 6. Okay, so then for this one, that'd be uh, 1 plus 5, and then 3 plus 14 is 17, and then negative 2 plus 8 is 6. Okay, so any question about that step? And then, finally, um, this would be what? 6, 7, is it 31? So 31, and then plus uh, 5, plus 34 is 39, plus 18. 
57. <clears throat> so then adding those together would be 88. Terrific. So any question about, about this? Yes? So did we interpret this number to say like, like that, that's, that's this, how much the, the differential has changed? Or the, what, the, uh, the, the blue light has changed? That, that, that number on, on, the, um, on the image that you drawn earlier, yes. that, that would be the shorter dotted line that's between the, that, 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 that is. Not, not the yes, okay. yes. What that would mean in this picture, in this picture, supposing that this is, supposing that this is F, that would mean this length right here between the horizontal axis of the new origin and the linearization, that is 88. Okay, then the, the increment could be something else. Preferably, if, uh, sorry, the, 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 inc the function increment could be something else, but hopefully if the function is differentiable and if the increment is small enough, it should be close to 88. Yes? So, okay. so in essence then, what we need in our example is that we have a we have this uh, f formula g formula that outputs a three dimensional vector, um, but we're moving uh, the first variable, which in this case is occupied by twenty four by one, and then we're moving the other one by two. Yes. So in essence, we're going twenty five fifty. Yes. And then we're seeing that, and then now we're putting it by so that it's kind of an estimate of that. Yes. Okay. It's, it's like estimating the change. How would, how would the function's output change, supposing from the input 2451, you moved this increment 1, 2? Yeah, to, to, the, to the new position 2553. 1, 2, I guess, relatively far. Right. Yeah. So it would go from 17. Yes, uh, yes. So it's a big change right there. It's changing quick there. But like I said, normally the increment is small. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we are, of course, going to dot product. Is something similar for the specific case of cross product? Yes, the result is exactly the same with cross product. Right. You can just take that <coughs> exact same line and replace the dots with crosses, but you have one more requirement. And that is that um, the output space has to be what size? Three. In principle, the input, the input space could be any size. Like you could be going from R1 <coughs> to R3. Or you could be going to R55 to R3. Uh, but you can only compute cross products of the output if the output is in dimension three. Thanks. Other questions? Okay, good. <coughs> This part is, this part is always a, a bear, because it's so such a departure from what you see up to this point. Okay. <clears throat> so now finally we get to the, the the big one, the one that that really matters. Okay, and that is uh, we get to the chain rule. So as a reminder of what uh, composition is. Uh, composition is like uh, you've got three sets U, V, and W. And then suppose that in U we have a point A. And suppose that we know how to get from U to V, and the way that we get from U to V is with G. So G is able to take us here to there. So, so suppose G does that. So we could map this A over to here, uh, to this point, say. And suppose we call that B is G of A. And then furthermore, suppose we know how to turn V things into W things. Uh, and the way we do that is with F. So that we could take this B and we could map it over here, say, to right there. And this is point C is 
F evaluated at B. Okay, so what I want you to see is that there's, there's three spaces and we're, we're, so far we're saying, well, let's, let's look at how we do this with intermediate steps. First, the first step, then the second step. Well, we also want to know, well, what if we just try to ignore what's on the inside and just, just look at the first and last, okay? Uh, that's the composed function. So what's the name for the composed function? F circ G, right? So F composed with G. That, that uh, symbol right there is, for young mathematicians, and youngish mathematicians anyway, is often pronounced circ because that's the command in LaTeX that you have to type to make it show up. Okay, so then uh, that means that we could also name C, besides, besides calling it F of B, we could also call it C is F composed with G evaluated at A. So that's construing, uh, construing the procedure to have exactly one step. You input the A and out comes the C and who cares what happened in the middle. Okay, altogether I guess you could say it like this. C is F evaluated at G evaluated, uh, F evaluated at G of A, like so. Okay. And what we want to know is that how does how does the derivative behave uh, with regard to this? Okay, so in order to make sure that you don't lose the forest for the trees, uh, I want to remind you of the result from linear algebra. So here's one major thing that I want to say to make, <laughs> to make sure that I'm going to ask and I want to make sure that the, that the answer is clear. Why is it that you have to take linear algebra before this class? <laughs> well, <laughs> let me ask the question like this. In what context in this class are matrices showing up? Right. So, yeah, that's how, that's how you represent lin linear functions. And, and when you actually choose coordinates and you want to have a specific representation of the derivative, it is a matrix. So the derivative is a matrix. So you have to take linear algebra before this class. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to make sense of, of us saying that the derivative is a matrix. Okay, so now let's, let's momentarily just consider some functions that are linear and what does it mean to compose them. So here I'm talking about any functions at all any functions at all, but let's, let's consider specifically what if they were linear. What if F and G were linear? So one of the results from linear algebra is that every linear function is representable uh, as a matrix multiplied by its input. Okay, so every, every single one can be represented in that way. And furthermore, everything that is a matrix multiplied by its input is a linear function. So these are in exact correspondence to each other. So suppose that let, let A be the matrix of F and B the matrix of G. That is to say uh, that G evaluated at X is, uh, is BX and that F evaluated at Y, I guess, is AY. Suppose that's the case. Then what does it mean? How do you, how do you compose them? Then, F composed with G evaluated at X. So before we get too far, I want to ask, uh, I, didn't, I didn't say, 
So if I, if I retroactively edit this and say that this is some subset of Rn, and this one is some subset of Rm, and this one is some subset of Rp, so if that's the way it is, then you should be able to tell me the, uh, the what am I trying to say, the rows and columns of B and A. So how big is B? So because, because B is the matrix of G, it's M by N, right? M by N. And because A is the matrix of F, What's the size rows and columns for the matrix for A? P by M. <coughs> input, output, input, output. Okay. Well, according to the rules, this should be F evaluated at G of X. Right, just following your nose. Then what's G of X? It's B multiplied by X, right? And then what does F do? It multiplies by A, on the left, notably. So now, just as a as a brief moment of sanity, let's make sure that we don't lose our minds. Is that even a compatible product? Well, let's make sure. So this is M by N, right? And this one is P, P by M. So in the first place, is ignoring the X for a moment, is that a compatible product? It is. And then what kind of, what, what is the size of X? n by 1, n by 1, and then taking all of that together, supposing you carried out, what's the size of this? p by 1. Is that right? It is right, because the composed function should take things that have input of size n and, out, and produces things output of size p. So is it doing it? Yes. So now here's the upshot, a big upshot from linear algebra. And that is that when you have linear functions and you compose them, that's equivalent to matrix multiplication. That's an enormous thing, enormous. So let me say it one more time. Composition of linear maps is matrix multiplication. That's why matrix multiplication is so important, because, com because in the end, composition is so important. That's also why matrices are so successful as a tool and a technique in math is because, in the end, composition is important. Okay. <clears throat> so I'll write that down now. <laughs> okay, so then, composition of linear maps, linear functions, is equivalent to matrix multiplication. Okay, so now there's, now there's two glaring reasons why you simply must take linear algebra before this course. The first reason is that when you choose coordinates and you actually want a numerical representation, the representation of a derivative is, is a matrix. So you can't you can't take the, you can't succeed in this course until you know how to deal with that. And then second, the most important thing you can do with functions is compose them. And the only way you can compose you can compose things where where the derivative is involved. Well, the way that you compose linear things is by matrix multiplication. Okay, good. So any question about this? Finally. <coughs> Yeah? When you multiply like a linear thing, the output will always be linear, I'm guessing? Like I'm not sure I understand. Uh, the, the A linear function, the B linear function, the output will, will have to be linear, that makes, makes sense. But the, the composition of F and of G, if F and G are both linear, 
the yes. So if you if you take if you take the set of linear maps, uh, which are which are composable, the composition of two linear functions is linear. Yes, composition preserves linearity. Okay, good. Uh, so now the question is: Is how does the derivative uh, how does the derivative play uh, along with composition? Okay, so here's the result. Theorem. The chain rule. Let U, a subset of Rn, be open with A in U. Uh, let V, a subset of Rm, be open. Uh, and furthermore, we need the following things, that, that F is a function, no, we want G to be the first function. So G is going from U to RM, and that B, which is G of A, is in V, and F is from V to RP. So it's the same setup as before, except now I'm insisting that I'm insisting that U V and W are oh, sorry, that U and V are open. That's that's that's, that's what I'm insisting now. Okay. So if uh, if G is differentiable at A and F is differentiable at B, then <coughs> F composed with G is differentiable at A, and we can say exactly what its derivative is in terms of the derivative of G at A and the derivative of F at B. <coughs> and the derivative of the composition evaluated at A applied to H is <coughs> The derivative of f evaluated at b multiplied by the derivative of g evaluated at a and apply this to h. Okay, so now this is this is the chain rule and it, and it can be written, so I've written all these square brackets and these h's uh, because this is how you would actually compute it if you sat down with pencil and paper or, or keyboard and program to, to do it. Okay, but you could, you can, for this specific formula, you can somewhat dispense with, uh, with the matrix representation and things like that. And you can say, well, what it actually is, is the derivative of F composed with G <coughs> evaluated at A is actually the derivative of F evaluated at B composed with the derivative of G evaluated at A. So that's interesting. This is really interesting. Because what it's saying, what it's saying is that the derivative distributes across composition. It distributes across composition. The, the, the notable thing that occurs though is that G has to be evaluated at A whereas F has to be evaluated where? At G of A, which, is, which we're calling B. Okay, so now, uh, it helps to have a picture of what's going on. <coughs> so specifically, why should it be this way?
So suppose we have three spaces. And suppose we can get from the first place to the second with a G. That G is able to do this. And suppose we can get from the second to the third with an F. That F is able to do that. Then of course you can get from the first to the last with from from the first to the last with a composition. Okay? So now suppose furthermore that we have our favorite point A in the first space. And also suppose so so this is Remember, this is where we're going to put our new origin. Okay, then suppose that from A, we're going to take a step, an incremental step. And its increment is H. So here's my question to you. What G is going to do, G is going to push forward this thing. It's going to push forward this anchor and this increment. It's going to push it over to the next space. So. Suppose that A gets pushed to, say, this spot, and we're going to call this B, is G of A. So what I'm telling you is that the way that you know that this red spot becomes that red spot is G's telling you to do that. G's saying that, that, that red spot becomes that red spot. Then what becomes, what becomes of this one? So say that this H this increment gets transformed to, say, some big, some even longer one, like this, and that this is k. Well, the formula for b is g of a. So g is telling a how to become a b. Who is telling h how to become a k? It's the derivative applied to h. So this is the derivative of, uh, sorry, the derivative of G at point A applied to H. So to, to get a, to, to move the anchor, you use the function. To find the new increment, you use the derivative. Interesting. So suppose that we take this anchor B this anchor B, and we move it over to here with F, and suppose that it becomes parts, uh, point C. So what's the formula for point C? F of, G. F of B. And suppose that along with the anchor B, we also transport the increment K, and we transport it to the, to the third space. And suppose that uh, it gets say, uh, even longer, just for sake of argument, and, and it turns a little bit. And suppose that uh, HKL is the next one. So we have L is the new increment over here. Well, what's the formula for L? Yes, it's the derivative of F evaluated at B applied to the increment that we had over there, which is K. So what I'm telling you is that the functions tell the anchors how to move, A to B, B to C. And the derivative of these functions tell the increments how to move, H to K, K to L. Yes? So for example, if the six, for the visit, there was another function H that, uh, that Let's say another function uh, Q, because <laughs> we already have an H. Okay. The derivative of H evaluated at C, uh, the derivative of Q evaluated at C uh, times, uh, L. applied to L. Yes. Okay. So what's happening is every time you move, the new location is given to you by the function, and the new increment, the new way you're going to step, is given by the derivative of the function applied to the increment that was over here. So the question is: Is what if we want to ignore? What if we want to ignore the intermediate step and just ask, how does an A become a C? And how does an H become an L, ignoring the intermediate step? Well,
then what is, in that case, what's the formula for C? In terms of A only. Yeah, it's F composed with G evaluated at A, or if you like, F of G of A. So that's the formula for C, only in terms of A, ignoring the intermediate value B. And what is the formula for L? Right, it's, it's whatever, so L in the first place is that. So that is the derivative of F. Uh, we're going to evaluate it at B, but I don't want to write B because I'm trying to ignore the intermediate step. So what am I going to write? Uh, G of A, right? And then this says K, but I don't want to write K because that's part of the intermediate. So I come back here and say, oh, K was D evaluated at G. Uh, sorry, the derivative of G evaluated at A applied to H. And then, of course, this is, this is exactly what the chain rule is. It couldn't be any more natural. It's the most natural result in, all of, in, in, in this whole thing. Okay, it's just saying that suppose that you've got a whole list of steps. How do you cancel the intermediate steps? Just follow your nose. Any question about this? Okay, so the main thing I want you to take away from this is that the function tells the anchor how to move. The derivative tells the increment how to move. Yes? So, uh, unless the instead of A was 1, 2, then H is, uh, say A is the order of 0, then H is 1, 2. Okay. Right, so then that would be telling us, like, uh, from A to B would be G of A, would be, it would change to some other value, and then from there, like, um, what 1, 2 value that the same thing would be from G. I, th I think so you're saying the right thing. So the k is g evaluated at one two, therefore showing kind of the amount of change occurring between. K is the derivative of g evaluated at the original anchor multiplied by one two. So you've got to you got to yeah, yeah, compute yeah. the derivative. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is, that would that would tell us the, the, the incremental change of evaluating through g mm -hmm. between a and h. Right. Other questions? Okay, good. So the chain rule. <clears throat> what time is it? Lots of time. 250 seconds. <laughs> okay. So we're, we're starting it close. Good. So now we're in section 1-9. Okay, so this is the mean value theorem and differentiability. Okay, so in the first place, uh, we, we know the mean value theorem for scalars, for, for, for functions which take scalars to scalars. That's one of the things you have to prove. Okay, so then supposing that this is true and that you've proved it, uh, then we will also want to have a mean value theorem for the following. So uh, let f uh, let f from u to R m no, it's got to be scalars. So from u to the scalars with u a subset of R n is open. And furthermore, the set which I'll denote by this, so a b. So now, A is a vector, B is a vector, we're almost done here, uh, and what I want, this is just notation, I want you to think of this like a closed interval from with endpoint A and endpoint B, but understand these are vectors. So specifically what I mean by this is this is the set of all T multiplied by A plus 
uh, 1 minus t multiplied by b such that t is in 0 to 1. And I need it to be the case that this is a subset of u. So now, can someone tell, tell us what this is? This is kind of a convoy. Yeah, so this is, this, what this is, is this is a line segment connecting point A to point B. And I need this to be a subset of U. So to be clear, I'm talking about something like this. If this is U, then I'm talking about here's A, here's B, and it must be the case that this whole line segment, including the endpoints, is a subset of U. Okay, here's a non-example. Suppose that this is A, and this is B. Do you observe that the line segment connecting A and B actually is not contained in U? Because we leave. Okay, so this one, yes. The other one, no. So. I need a function that is defined, uh, defined on a set that's open that contains this line segment. And furthermore, <coughs> I need it to be the case. And <coughs> f is differentiable on u. So notably, because f is differentiable on this open set and because the line segment is co strictly contained in that open set, that also means that uh, f is continuous on that line segment. So this implies f is continuous on the line segment from A to B. So these statements, these conditions, are analogous to the requirements of the mean value theorem. Uh, that the, the, the mean value theorem that you, which you must prove. So the result is, and we'll just have enough time to say the result, is there exists a C in that line segment, in fact, in the line segment not including the endpoints, A to B, such that <coughs> the derivative of our function f evaluated at this c and then multiplied by the difference of b and a is equal to f of b minus f of a. So now, this, this is the same statement as the mean value theorem, except I couldn't write it as a quotient. Why couldn't I write it as a quotient? Because you can't divide by a vector. So really, the real statement is derivative multiplied by increment. And so I'd like you to think back to the mean value theorem and think, oh yeah, I could write that as derivative and then multiplied by the denominator of that other thing. Okay, so that's all the time we have, so have a nice Thursday.